Super. I think I think it's time to start for us. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to see uh, these people here, colleagues, co-authors, uh, co-editors, designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are gathering here to start to launch a book, the new book by the Laboratory of Critical Urbanism, Retooling Knowledge Infrastructures in a Nuclear Town. This is the book that summarizes four summer, five summer schools in Visaginas, a former nuclear town in Lithuania. My name is Sergei Lubimo. I'm one of the authors and the co-editor of the book. Uh, my co-authors and co-editors are in Zoom room as well. But uh, it happened that uh, kind of I took more liberty, more responsibility to summarize this uh, book project. So I will be showing this kind of teaser slides. Uh, it will take some 20, 25 minutes just to uh, kind of to present an angle of what we were doing there within this project and, and also to tell a little bit about the process and result, and then my co-authors, co-editor, uh, uh, designer, and hopefully uh, and hopefully uh, reviewers if they're here, and the guests will be able to converse uh, about the, uh, like the book pieces that were already sent out and about this, uh, this presentation. So I'm just uh, going to uh, share my screen and uh, yeah, just please sit back for some kind of uh, yeah, 20, 20 minutes. So uh, I would start with a question. I mean, the, the title uh, is could sound intriguing a little bit, uh, like uh, whether there is something like this as nuclear town uh, in general, in reality, if something like this exists. So basically the main angle of this book uh, in the whole process was uh, about energy transformations and uh, energy tra transformations as geographic processes. So the question was, uh, how does energy change uh, and and uh, energy change and uh, energy infrastructures in general cause some way specific ways uh, of how people organize space, live space, experience space? Like uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff uh, done on this topic. For example, the the historical studies of how coal is connected to railway and with uh, this way with mass exchange of goods and with proliferation of spaces for retail in cities and then uh, consolidation of uh, national territories in effect. Uh, in very similar way, uh, people talk uh, or, or show how does oil intensify international infrastructural projects like cooperative ones and thus uh, make possible exogen exogenous state building as opposed to endogenous. And, and uh, so this way it changed this you know, international geography. And also this way it, uh, causes some processes, new processes in cities, such as motorization, for example, and, and then rebuilding of cities. And uh, for example, in the Charter of Athens by, by Le Corbusier and the, the, the modernist uh, architects, uh, the colleagues, it's uh, very much uh, uh, emphasized. So uh, also today, it's very topical uh, in this discussion about um, what would be the effects of uh, low carbon electricity generation? Like what, what kind of uh, spatial effects will be there? Will it be about large remote actors such as uh, like offshore uh, wind or, or nuclear or large scale solar infrastructures and, and uh, long distance transmission or it would be rather uh, decentralization and micro generation. So uh, basically the, the this, the, 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 the topic behind this question is what is the space society relations inherent in nuclear, uh, in nuclear, just trying to change slides, but uh, it doesn't work yet. Uh, so uh, our case study in this, when working with this question is Pisaginas in Lithuania, which is a, satellite of the Ignalin nuclear power plant. And uh, it was launched in 1983, still in Soviet Union and decommissioned in, 19, uh, in 2009 uh, due to the European Commission requirements. From 2000, Visaginas uh, in conventional uh, uh, social researchers view was considered as a monofunctional deindustrializing town. So it made it very exciting to think about its future. So in its high uh, uh, point, it had 35,000 of inhabitants. Now it has less than 20,000 of, of inhabitants. Uh, the town was built very quickly and, and from scratch very, very quickly, just within 15 years. 
And uh, from this uh, perspective, uh, it presents a very nice possibility to observe the kind of pure case of endurance of socialist modernist urban form in new socioeconomic conditions, such as the, in this particular case, the closure of town forming enterprise plus integration to the, to the EU market. So the question is what kind of political heritage related entrepreneurial lifestyle responses are generated by this combination of socialist modernist urban form and the EU uh, social economic conditions. So uh, from this, uh, let's say more uh, applied perspective, we were thinking about what could be the future of nuclear towns when the nuclear power plant is closed and uh, what kind of society is shaped around particular energy infrastructures so around nuclear energy in this particular case. And then what kind of past dependencies such infrastructure society relations have. And uh, for us, in many ways, initial trigger was that uh, Visaginas monofunctionalism was often reproduced in future development projections, in both in discourses and in, in strategies, somehow analogically to Ignalin nuclear power plant sources of development were projected beyond the town limits. Like, you know, like on this map, it's like data center, industrial zone, smart park. So kind of one big employer has to replace uh, Ignalin nuclear power plant. And we were trying to, do, to reprogram this situation when the town is regarded as mere supplement to outside industry as something passive. And uh, here it's important to understand that initially nuclear power plant uh, and town in this particular case were run as one entity by the Ignalin nuclear power plant director. It was not unusual in Soviet context, but in this case, it was amplified by the nuclear technology strategic uh, function. So it was stronger than, than elsewhere. So of course, we know from urban research that in Soviet uh, economy, it was not, uh, not unusual at all uh, in case of monofunctional towns in Soviet Union. And after Chernobyl catastrophe and later after Lithuania's independence, the relations between Ignalin nuclear power plant and Visaginas became dehermitized. So both the enterprise and the settlement became more transparent. Their function started to be publicly scrutinized, contested, redefined. And uh, basically the, the, how we can register it today, these relations are in the process or these two entities are in the process of uh, disconnection or disentanglement is this quite a powerful metaphor uh, used uh, today in, 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 uh, in different research perspectives. So basically our focus is on institutions and infrastructures in Visaginas that are crucial in this process of disconnection or disentanglement. Uh, just uh, to get a little bit to contextualize more, uh, it's important to say that Visaginas dilemmas cannot be properly, dilemmas today, I mean, cannot be properly addressed without addressing the scale of the USSR and Northwest United Power System which included uh, several nuclear power plants, the, the Leningrad nuclear power plant on the north, the Ignalin nuclear power plant on the west, uh, Smolensk uh, uh, on the east, and uh, in the east, and, and Chernobyl in the south. So uh, they all basically belong to this period of late 60s and, and then 70s. And this was the period of spread of nuclear technologies to the Western part of the USSR. And also it was the moment when this Airbnb uh, type of uh, reactor uh, started to be used. And it, technologically, it was important that it was a type of reactor that could be assembled on site. So you didn't need any uh, prior urban industrial history on the site where you, one wanted to build a reactor. It meant greater mobility of, of uh, nuclear facilities. So the nuclear power plant was a part of this Northwest United Power System, which was providing electricity to all Baltic states, Belarus, Kaliningrad region. In Lithuania, nationally, previously, there was just electronic power plant, which was working on heavy oil. Now it's transformed to, and, and is working on gas, natural gas. Actually, it's also interesting that uh, the the, uh, the Ignalin nuclear power plant is located right on the border, uh, this Latvia and Belarus, and border is very crucial now in relation to Astraves nuclear power plant, uh, which was uh, just finished uh, in Belarus. It's a very contentious project, one of the one of the most contentious projects uh, uh, in this uh, region uh, today. But uh, at the moment when Ignalin nuclear power plant was uh, planned in the in the seventies, border was hardly a factor. So it, in general, it's a very, very young border that became, I mean, between Lithuania and Belarus that became uh, relevant only, only in the 90s. Also this one could, uh, when, when to think uh, about this Northwest 
USSR Northwest United Power System. And to look at this map, it's uh, very graspable the, the 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 issue of Lithuanians Lithuania's uh, infrastructural dependence on Soviet-made energy grid. So in yellow is network of of electricity transmission. And, and so despite of profound institutional and cultural change infrastructure, it's in many ways still, still there uh, back in the, this uh, Soviet period. So why it is important, because in general in USSR, planning, building, and, and exploiting energy infrastructure is was really constitutive for statehood. And, and the, there is much higher determination of statehood by energy infrastructures than in the West. Uh, and also one compared the maps with the Western Europe where the, the network of energy infrastructure is much uh, is denser and, and uh, also it's much more the result of the market or of organic growth of negotiation, not of some powerful imposition from, from the top here. One can uh, uh, think of this Vladimir Lenin uh, famous quote that, that, that communism is Soviet power plus electrification of the whole country. There are several big theories, I would say, which, which are playing, but it's not playing, but, we, but kind of trying to uh, make sense of it in this uh, big theoretical terms, like James Scott, of course, and, and Stephen Kohler are working uh, with this. So then what is the resulting urban form if to, if to scale it uh, down a little bit? So that, uh, as I was saying, it was built very quickly for only 15 years from 75 to 90 and uh, on virgin nature. And this is the trope which is often repeated by uh, the current uh, inhabitants of Visaginas. There was no prior urban history needed and just the lake was crucial to cool down the reactor. And uh, another thing that it was really very richly built, and I guess Martinez could, could uh, talk about it a little bit more today, as, as our colleague uh, Indra Rusevskaya has put it, it's a zoo or a museum of Soviet modernist architecture from the period because of the variety of types of residential buildings from, from, from that particular historical moment. And this fact that it's richly built today makes uh, possible to kind of think about it as a welfare town. Like, and this is something that Soviet nuclear settlements share today. Like uh, in many ways, it's, uh, it's a kind of spatial and socially defined path dependency. I mean, this, this density, this very, very high density of welfare infrastructures and this, uh, this uh, kind of conditions when you could walk anywhere. So this kind of very, very uh, welfare oriented uh, environment it's also a bubble socially with very weak connection to the region and uh, with the biggest percentage of foreign born inhabitants in Lithuania, also with high level of education and, so and social status, but also unconventional ethnically, it's uh, probably the only place in the country today where Russian language dominates. And uh, also in the 90s and in 2000s, like, uh, starting from Lithuania's independence, both academic research-based and also public discussions of Visaginas were very clearly centered on issues of shock, of disorientation, of, of nostalgia. So uh, basically, uh, like understanding this, we started to look for isomorphism among USSR nuclear industry towns, basically about what, what do they share or, or what, what is in common there? And is there something like a nuclear urbanism? Uh, that there is one of the chapters in the book that is named like this. We started to understand that all Soviet nuclear locations are similar institutionally. They were planned and managed by the Ministry of Medium Machine Building and also projected and constructed and often fully from nuclear technology like reactors to master plan and public spaces by a particular Leningrad-based research and design institute, the, the All Union Research and Design Institute for Energy Technologies in Russian language, the acronym is VNIPIET. And uh, from the very beginning, this institute was connected to military domain, let's say. And uh, also from, from, from the beginning, the first uh, VNIPIET sites were related to already existing Soviet military facilities mainly arm producing factories. If to look at the lineage of this, like of, of, of the uh, cities or, or, or territories that were used by this institute. So earlier sites of uh, Dnipiet uh, were combining extractive, productive and research functions. And Visaginas is a later, or, or one could even say cleaner stage of nuclear site. It's monofunctional, uh, having only goal of producing electricity, and even the building materials were, built, were, were brought from elsewhere. And in terms of planning solutions, Visaginas is particular because it's a node, uh, 
it's having a node uh, of a pedestrian, like it, it's having pedestrians treat as a node. And it was uh, uh, in many ways, the, like one of the one of the results of the let's say Lithuanian uh, architects participating in the in the project, like trying to make it more similar to this medieval, you know, or or, or not medieval, pre-modern uh, urban structure. Like the, the chief architect was actually from Vilnius, so he was trying to bring some of the kind of ideas, his ideas that he got from Vilnius Old Town to the to the to the planning process uh, in Visaginas. Uh, also, uh, again, coming back to this isomorphism, what, what was interesting is that, or relevant, is that the, one could uh, observe that the notions of comfort uh, were negotiated and crystallized in the whole network of the USSR nuclear sites planned by the NIPET. One can find it in, in uh, memoirs, for example, of the, of the uh, current uh, Visaginas uh, residents. As the, inter, the, the one of the things that like everyone notices today is this integration of urban structure to the forest. And one could say that in many ways it was taken from uh, other cases in which, uh, uh, let's say, nuclear industry was developing in the USSR, not necessarily this NIPET sites. For example, uh, one could say that uh, some solutions come from Novosibirsk Academic Garadok in Siberian forest. Which was the, the the town itself? This kind of campus, academic campus, uh, was a result of decentralization of science infrastructures after Stalin's death. Another uh, like, like a reference point or another uh, um, you know, case that influenced uh, Visaginas in this respect was Sosnovy Bor town, at, at, like the, the the satellite town of Leningrad nuclear power plant. Uh, like on the Gulf of Finland, this this uh, kind of northern part of the uh, Northwest United Power System, and uh, there in Sosnovo Borko also experience of planning resort towns near the Gulf of Finland were used. So uh, if to look at the biographies of uh, planners and of of uh, workers who came to. Uh, live in Visaginas, one could see that a lot of them are coming precisely, especially those. Uh, having top positions are coming precisely from Novosibirsk Akademik Garadok and from Leningrad nuclear power uh, and from uh, Sosnovo Bor, the, the satellite town of uh, Leningrad nuclear power plant. There is a very nice uh, book by Paul Josephson on Novosibirsk Akademik Garadok where uh, he is showing how much it was the goal to make this there to make the scientific process more autonomous from political process and also to facilitate this creative encounter between different scientists and thus make science more productive. The Saginus is rather different in this perspective. So it was not the environment was uh, not planned to kind of to foster creativity, but rather to uh, create this kind of absolute uh, full, you know, strong. Uh, uh, environment for resting, you know, so one like service in nuclear power plant, but doesn't have to be creative, but rather need to be calm and and focused and and disciplined. So I think uh, I saw some some uh, approaches solutions solutions are migrating from 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 Novosibirsk Akademik Garadok to, to Visaginas, still it's uh, social institutionally, this are rather different project. So it, it's also interesting that today this integration into forest, this green infrastructures is considered in town as an asset and, and starts to be discussed as heritage. We were part of this discussion discussions in August this year when we were doing the most recent summer school. So uh, here it's it's in general it's interesting that uh, the, the the idea of nuclear towns in nature and in pine trees uh, in particular is kind of a cultural value produced by the nuclear people as a professional group. So uh, uh, we could see this, this uh, kind of request to have more pine trees starting from Obninsk in 1950s, then Novosibirsk Akadem Gorodok in 60s, then Sosnovy Bor in 60s and 70s, and then besides this kind of more uh, kind of uh, fuller real realization of this principle in 70s and in 80s. And uh, if to think now, for example, to how to make heritage out of Visaginas as nuclear town. Of course, forest factor would need to be scrutinized in this, in this context. And uh, in analogy to planning solutions, uh, a population of community of Visaginas can properly be understood also only when regarded in this Soviet nuclear network. It was socialized and professionalized in other USSR nuclear locations. 
even those family members that are not directly related to the nuclear power plant and uh, not only notions of comfort but also notions of belonging were crystallized in this wider network of soviet nuclear sites uh, with a strong attachment to built environment uh, people who actually constructed the town still live there and cultivate this connection and there is this trope uh, in in memoirs and research interviews uh, that people are saying that we were building it for ourselves with love, so kind of feeling or having access to something exclusive that nuclear industry could provide. And so uh, from this perspective, we just discussed that Soviet nuclear people is a very particular culture uh, within the USSR. I think if Michal is joining, probably uh, he could uh, maybe develop uh, on it, uh, elaborate on it uh, later. So, uh, and of course, this, the, the workforce was quite strictly technocratically disciplined. So this is a working biography of someone who was, uh, for whom the Agnes Nishkus was one of the episodes in the work, uh, in, in life. And we see that the, 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 in the sixties, the Chelyabinsk 40 is the, you know, the closed town in, in Urals, uh, one could say the first one. Uh, yeah, it's actually the the you know, the, the one uh, uh, which uh, Kate Brown compares to Richland in, in in the United States in Washington State. Then uh, after working there for some time, this person moves to uh, the, another nuclear town near the border with China and Mongolia. Then uh, Novosibirsk and Russia due to health problems, just uh, to to live in a big university town, uh, like. To, to cure, you know, probably after getting some health issues uh, uh, in one of these uh, two sites. And then in the 80s coming to Visaginas, back then called Snezhkus, and then moving uh, in the beginning of 90s, uh, there was this uh, partial exodus of, of uh, nuclear specialists to Russia after, after uh, Lithuanian independence to to Nova Voronezh nuclear power plant near the border with Ukraine. So it's like, it just shows that uh, this, this uh, Soviet nuclear sociality is, is a network one. And we, we should like, it, we, we need really multi-sided multi lens to, to kind of, to make sense of what the nuclear city is, what the nuclear urbanism is. So uh, from this perspective, for sure, the Saginus is part of the lineage uh, uh, of, of starting uh, or, or going back to Soviet secret of map nuclear towns, usually of military purpose. And, and uh, starting from Chelyabinsk 40, that was mentioned in the previous slide, which was picked for nuclear bomb construction near Karachai Lake in Urals in uh, 46, 1946. And this lineage is evidenced in the realms of technology, of course, of institutions, organizations, of individual biographies, but uh, we could, so from this perspective, we could talk uh, also about the normative and, and symbolic realms. And uh, this actually mm, opens a very interesting question about how nuclear urbanization is different from other cases of industry-led urbanization and what would be the difference to other monofunctional industrial towns. And uh, here, in contrast to other industrialization projects in Lithuania under Soviet rule, nuclear power plant was really impenetrable bubble for, for local scientists, for local bureaucracy. It was accountable to the Ministry of Medium Machine Building in Moscow. And basically most of the people taking the strategic, the top positions there were graduates from the universities in Russia. So in this perspective, it, like really this post-colonial lens wouldn't work there because in, uh, in let's say in discussions about the Soviet period in Lithuania, there are more and more arguments about how the Soviet rule was subjugating, of course, but also uh, making possible to nurture, you know, this uh, massive bureaucratic, urban, and and industrial society. So, in this sense, like people say, that rather one should take post-colonial lens, not anti-colonial lens. But in this particular case, post-colonial lens do not work there, just because it was really it was really a bubble for for wider society. This is a difference uh, uh, from Ukraine, for example. In Ukraine, the situation could be regarded from, from post-colonial uh, perspective uh, when looking at the careers, for example, of, of nuclear scientists in, in, in Ukraine, as opposed to Lithuania. And uh, also how, uh, and looking also looking at the technological lineage of, of uh, of uh, nuclear industry in Ukraine. So there were like people who were taking 
the, the uh, key positions in the Ministry of Media and Machine Building in Moscow, many of them had experience of working in industry in Ukraine uh, before in the 30s and the 40s, and then becoming key key people in, in the in the uh, on the on the Soviet level, let's say. So uh, one could say then that in contrast to other industries in Lithuania, Ignalin nuclear power plant was uh, a bubble and in many ways it made it a strategic target of pro-independence movement. After Chernobyl disaster, it was very easy to narrativize it as harmful and as totally unaccountable infrastructure. And it created momentum for alliance between dissidents and Lithuanian communist bureaucracy. So uh, uh, the stopping the construction of the third unit of Ignalin nuclear power plant in 1988 was uh, uh, a totally unexpected amount of liberty taken at that moment. And uh, also, in many ways, it paved way for the for the uh, success of uh, pro-independence popular front uh, in Lithuania. This is a photo from the Ring of Life uh, event in 1988, when uh, Lithuanian civil society, like several tens of thousands of people, gathered around Tignalin nuclear power plant, demanding to stop the construction of the third unit. Again, after, after Chernobyl catastrophe, it was... Uh, it was uh, yeah, it was easy to make it a target, basically. Uh, so uh, now the question is how to describe the current stage after the the commissioning. And this is the slide uh, from uh, the World Status Nuclear uh, World Nuclear Status Report by Michael Schneider and and uh, and colleagues. Michael Schneider Consulting is not uh, emerging of our from our research. I think it's it's really nicely summarizes that there is a huge relevance uh, today. Uh, because we see that uh, there is increasing need to get ready to what comes to nuclear sites after nuclear power uh, is not produced anymore. Uh, 40 years is considered to be a conventional lifespan of a nuclear reactor. And as we see, the, the mean age of, of a nuclear reactor is 31 years old, and 20% of the nuclear reactor fleet are now being over 41 years old, and 40 is considered to be a you know a border. That means that uh, uh, more and more, more and more uh, cases like uh, misogynists today are ahead, and I think it's uh, just worse kind of thinking of how you know how to understand them, how to study them. Uh, in particular, uh, nuclear energy driven urbanization has very important temporality aspect that we are addressing in the book. And uh, from this perspective, it would be justified to challenge this hegemonic narrative on Visaginas as a showcase of post industrial urban development, because, on one hand, dismantling is a very slow process, uh, uh, 20 more years estimated, but no one really guarantees. Uh, because it's uh, there were no templates uh, before. It's a very new kind of very very yeah, very uh, very innovative uh, uh, project of uh, dismantling of closing. On the other hand, it still has quite a lot of well-paid jobs around 2000 and interest from international organizations. So also to dismantle fundamentally new engineering inventions are acquired, and uh, in the Ignalin nuclear power plant. Uh, the the in this particular case the the uh, a lot of fundamentally new engineering in, inter interventions are still ahead so basically innovations are needed to phase out and and uh, like not to start up but to phase out and another issue is that nuclear waste will require thousands of years of professional management so uh, it all uh, kind of uh, provokes questions if nuclear industry is actually industry in social terms, like a, like a textile factory, which is uh, open, closed, and and uh, there is not that big impact as as, as it is with the nuclear, uh, like of the closure. I mean, so and then is it is it valid in general to take interruption of nuclear power plant as deindustrialization? Because from 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 engineers' perspective, from economists' perspective, for sure it is. But from societal perspective or from perspective of urban history, probably not, not, not really. And uh, so uh, I think uh, also it's, it's, it's interesting to, to, to look a little bit at, at uh, this political aspect here that uh, Russia is, is this, this is the age of Russian nuclear fleet. So Russia is one of the main stakeholders of nuclear uh, technology and industry. And, and a lot of Rosadam projects are realized worldwide. Like Russia is, invo is involved in 15 out of 
52 construction projects and, and also in eight out of 17 uh, countries uh, in which nuclear power plants are being built. Russia, Russia is there. So this just with a comparison, this just to compare with Western Europe, it's, it's, I think it's quite uh, saying, you know, it's very, very easily graspable. So uh, I think uh, I just uh, uh, try to speed up a little bit uh, because it's uh, almost half an hour. So uh, maybe just to uh, move to the second part of the title of the book also a little bit to better explain the angle and to explain the process. The, the, the whole project was started by the Laboratory of Critical Urbanism at the European Humanities University in Vilnius. And uh, the, the laboratory is combining critical urban studies as research agenda on one hand, also cross-sectoral cooperation and process of urban development and planning on the other hand. This project uh, stems from six applied urbanist summer schools and uh, two smaller conferences. Initially, our uh, focus was on shrinking cities research and on participatory social research, but later the focus was shifted to the issue of knowledge infrastructures. Basically, we were asking uh, to what extent the industrialization is also disruption of established modes to produce and to distribute knowledge. And uh, like a lot of research was done uh, there, mainly it, mainly it was qualitative interviews and expert interviews, group interviews, and, but also what was very important is the feedback to the, to the results of the summer schools. It also was uh, a material to, to think about, like to make sense of, to integrate uh, into the process of argument building. So at some point in 2016, uh, we uh, realized that uh, the left part of the town is either well renovated already uh, uh, or is expected to be in 2016, 2018, with the use of structural funds, or there are very precise plans for it. And uh, public spaces and buildings were intended mainly for commercial leisure and bureaucratic activities. And now we felt that agenda was to better define spaces and buildings for the right part of the town. So uh, yeah, also we realized that there were more public institutions working in the first uh, micro district, the left part of the town. Uh, although there was not much cooperation between them, rather competition instead of it. So we just realized that the density does not produce lively public culture and public space. And uh, so we started to think like what we could uh, do in these conditions with the uh, more focus on the right part. And uh, from the very beginning, the first workshop, we uh, it was already in 2015, and uh, it was done mainly with the scholars of shrinking cities in Germany and in the in the Baltics, and all, with the sectoral experts from Visaginas, from spatial planning, knowledge, and education, also from cultural and creative sectors. And we realized that uh, there were two important things that we have to have in mind. First, we realized there that community feels very misrepresented at that moment, and that uh, community is interested in attention from the outside, and. Uh, at the same time, in narratives of researchers and various storytellers at that uh, moment, like journalists, filmmakers, one could recognize that uh, there's probably too much or, or quite a lot of focus on nostalgia of the Saginaw's dwellers, too much focus on the past somehow. And the, the, the closure of Ignalin nuclear power plant was presented as a rupture that uh, basically happened uh, once and forever. So uh, we were trying to work with this to kind of retooling in this sense was kind of this uh, uh, applied urbanist work with these uh, issues that we recognized from the very beginning, this, this kind of dilemmas from which we were starting. So these are just uh, examples from uh, some of the activities. This is a group interview with the uh, uh, town's freelancers that were trying to uh, understand uh, how to uh, make some kind of collective initiative uh, to uh, try to, um, let's say, um, work with their own interests, you know, to, to promote their own interests uh, with the, uh, in cooperation with the governance of the city. So uh, there was particular, uh, the, the, this, this group interview was uh, part of, the, of our project in uh, 2019. Another one is, uh, I think Ben could uh, talk, or, or Ala Aksana, if uh, they're joining, I didn't see them earlier. It's uh, the, uh, just one of the results of a workshop that was combining critical cartography and silk printing, I think still in 2018. 
Uh, so there was like really like four years, there were a lot of uh, projects within the summer schools and also side projects like this, silk printing and critical cartography was uh, part of this. And uh, usually it was really uh, like the projects were, not, were about interventions, of course, but also were about uh, research, about developing kind of situations where uh, embedded and embodied methods of data gathering, documentation, triangulation were, uh, were there, and uh, also were used as platforms to cultivate the legitimacy of new urban project, the, the library, that uh, was one of our main uh, focus I will talk about it uh, when when unpack the third, the final question of this uh, presentation about the, what the book title is made of. And uh, so uh, here is this uh, last question, like knowledge infrastructures. We, uh, at some point we also, we agreed that nuclear power plant was not just a source of energy or of revenue or a locus of political power, but also knowledge infrastructure. And now I'm quoting Paul Edwards, it was a network of people, artifacts, and institutions that generate, share, and maintain specific knowledge about the human and natural worlds. And uh, so we just uh, agreed that from this perspective, Ignalin Nuclear Power Plant was giving meaning to town, was creating solidarity, disciplining community, and also giving perspective, perspective on the future. And then, of course, the question is, again, that I was already uh, briefly posing before, how does the industrialization transform the ecologies of knowledge production and transmission, what is interrupted, what is past dependent, and how does the interruption of the Ignalin nuclear power plant change with Saginaw's embeddedness in wider geography, which institutions and which infrastructures in town are crucial for this new mode of embeddedness. So, so basically it's about rescaling knowledge infrastructures of a town which has lost its, its uh, initial, initial function. And uh, so one of the very important you know, anchors for us uh, in this work was the library, the public library of the town, uh, both its institution and its infrastructure. So we were scrutinizing it from this uh, double perspective. So how changes in city industry relations transform ecology of knowledge? What could be the role of library in this process of transformation? And also what could be the role of library in the industrializing town? Uh, and in terms of both research and design, uh, the process was guided by two pro pragmatic aims to identify the types of users which need to be implemented in a reprogram building, and also uh, to link the functional reprogramming of the library to emerging forces which drive the long term reprogramming of the entire town. So we try to test what we learned about the town in our work on the scale of a particular library building. And uh, of course, not, not limiting uh, with the building. So library itself was just uh, uh, one of the nodes uh, of a network of institutions and communities which we, which, which, with which we were cooperating and also which we were trying to understand. And uh, so I think it was uh, uh, like part, some of the chapters were rather uh, uh, research-based some were just uh, documenting uh, the, the the processes that they that they can uh, place at the summer school, and and some were uh, actually proposals, you know, kind of some innovations in terms of design, but also in terms of proposed in institutions. So I think Ben and and Monica could uh, could uh, briefly uh, talk about the the uh, their chapter, uh, this this uh, kind of proposing new. Uh, institutions for, for to address the, the the needs of the town from perspective of migration, or or uh, also proposals uh, of new memory infrastructures that that I think Martinez and and Marjvides, if he's joining, could also uh, say something about this. So uh, I guess uh, uh, what was uh, also crucial is that uh, yeah we were trying to kind of to uh, connect this. Uh, design uh, uh, projects uh, on scale of one particular building to the to the broader scale of micro district and the entire town this for example in the in the sixth chapter there is this unpacking of idea of of the knowledge park as a kind of scenario for for uh, transformation of this uh, right part of the town that I was showing uh, several slides ago and uh, with the with the post with the hard and soft measures uh, uh, all connected to the library uh, as a node. 
like for example, uh, here I just briefly say that it, it was about five different zones, like uh, library surrounding area, the news park, passing area, nuclear power history, archaeology of knowledge. So basically a holistic integration of the library new developments into, into urban scale uh, processes. So uh, uh, I just uh, just very brief, just to finish, to start finishing, I just very briefly go uh, through the chapters and then I hope uh, co-editor and co-authors could uh, pick up on this uh, like in a reflective mode or, or in a mode of adding something or, or new slides. And, and uh, we could uh, move uh, to this more conversational uh, uh, mode again. So, uh, yeah, uh, so basically what I was talking about today in many ways, or, or it's in, in many ways it summarized this introductory uh, uh, chapters of the book. And uh, there is a chapter by Andrei Stepanov who is studying institutional uh, change of uh, uh, Ignalin nuclear power plant starting from uh, 70s basically till today. So uh, working with this notion of uh, nuclear exceptionalism. Uh, then there is a chapter on uh, how different the privatization process or, or the results of privatization in the science are. Uh, uh, then uh, there is a, a very nice uh, chapter by Ala Pigarska, which is on, uh, on uh, uh, public typography, basically. So it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, on handmaking modernist forms, the, the visual environment of the science from 70s to 2010s. So uh, kind of visual archaeology of, 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 of the Saginus. Uh, then uh, uh, the second section is less about research and uh, precisely more about uh, document, documenting design work and uh, documenting and uh, documenting design work and also chapters with the proposals themselves. So the, the, the first in this section and the sixth in the whole books is actually documenting the uh, workshop on the on the library building itself. Then there is a chapter by Bogdan, which is Bogdan Kapatila, which is uh, a comparative uh, uh, kind of take or also compar reflection, comparative reflection on, on uh, the urbanist projects in Visaginas and in Kramatorsk in Ukraine, and precisely on the on the on the library as a topic. Uh, then the, the chapter by Monica and uh, Ben, which is about uh, uh, precisely about proposing uh, an innovation in institutional landscape of city. And uh, the chapter by Martinez and Marshvides on memory infrastructures. Also, I hope uh, uh, it, could be, it could be still addressed today. And the uh, uh, kind of report on this uh, critical cartography and silk printing workshop by Ben Aksana and, uh, and Ala. So I think uh, it's a good moment for me probably to stop uh, sharing the screen and to try to move into more, more conversational uh, mode. I hope it was, uh, I hope it was uh, uh, transparent. I don't know, probably I, I should, I should uh, ask Ben maybe to, to add. I'm not sure Ben, which mood you would uh, pick to, to go on. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, just uh, maybe I would uh, try uh, I'd go more into the, the more sociable uh, mode. Um, just say a, a couple of things. And first is uh, just maybe thanks uh, all around. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Sergei for having this, uh, the innovative uh, ideas, which lie at the base of the book and also the, the, the uh, willpower. To see it through to the end in, in in circumstances that for lots and lots of reasons, some of which are maybe obvious and very public, some of which maybe less, uh, have been uh, difficult uh, for all of us. And and the continuity of the pro pro project over many years, I think, is uh, something that uh, is uh, really uh, really uh, in, in, in important. Uh, the se uh, the second kind of bit of thanks is just to, to the authors. Uh, I think although. Uh, uh, Sergei presented a very kind of tight uh, uh, conceptual uh, structure for the book. One of its key features is also the diversity of angles that the different uh, chapters go in, the different ways they develop um, you know, ideas, uh, starting from the from the kind of the the the, the conceptual knot that Sergei uh, presented. And one of the really fascinating things for me, which I don't uh, yet fully understand, is the extent to which uh, the book and the project revealed that 
the reveal of the uh, case of, of Visaginas as a nuclear town as something uh, exceptional and unique, uh, and the extent to which uh, the case reveals in very interesting and unusual ways much wider topics which apply uh, in many ways to many towns and cities in many in many spaces so, uh, that seems to me a kind of uh, the diversity of the book and the diversity of the project seems to me a great uh, a great value so it's thanks to the to the group of authors for the for the for the dip of the kind of the, the different ideas that you express and also having the stamina uh, and uh, fortitude to, to stay with this and uh, uh, and develop the book, uh, you know, see the book, see the book through to its uh, kind of happy, happy uh, fruition or uh, or kind of um, uh, realization. Yeah, and also the last the last word also to the, the designers working uh, very intensively, uh, whether it's all in different spaces at the very uh, under pressure of uh, time and resources to get the book uh, finished. So uh, obviously we're very grateful on that front uh, too. So. I, I, I guess in general terms that uh, uh, that would be it for me. The, the question of knowledge infrastructures as a, as a, as a kind of a lens for thinking about cities and how the and towns and how they're changing seems to me very uh, kind of fruitful one that can be applied very interestingly in very different ways. And that Visaginas is a is a as a as a kind of exceptional case uh, in this instance. Uh, reveals an awful lot, which uh, you know enables enables uh, kind of new ways of thinking and working in other towns. So, uh, in a general terms, that would be it. I'd be very happy to uh, kind of uh, speak in my turn about about the different chapters, along with other authors, if they are if they are present. Super. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Yes, indeed, the whole process was fun, but also very very difficult, uh, just because it's so long and and uh, like. Uh, like uh, it was fun to look to work with all the authors but not all the authors met each other i think some people are meeting for the first time so i think it's not very usual for the for the academic work and uh, yeah maybe we could reflect on this as well i guess as, as andre is not here maybe we just go maybe Ira, you could uh, you could pick up and say something maybe you go, we go chapter by chapter or uh yeah, probably I can. I wasn't preparing anything, but anyway, uh, so me and Vivia, who is not uh, here today, uh, we were comparing how the process of uh, constructing a clear power plant and uh, the process of dismantling were represented in uh, Soviet and uh, these days media. And we looked at different media packages and why we thought that it's important to look at uh, media, because in our idea, they just uh, not only resemble the reality, but they also construct the reality. So it was interesting to compare. And for us, uh, we also thought uh, about uh, this uh, nuclear town and this again, it's not that it's not only related uh, to a nuclear power plant itself, but uh, it's an assemblage of uh, different uh, social and technical elements. So for us, it was uh, interesting to compare how these different elements, uh, social, human and technical are represented in different media packages. And uh, yeah, probably the first thing that we noticed that yeah they were quite technical uh, but but still very very similar i would say that uh, the notion in time was important uh, in both uh, media packages although for uh, for different uh, reasons uh, in addition they there was uh, lots of uh, names of different equipment that it's even difficult to, to understand what is this for a person uh, who is not uh, who doesn't belong to this industry uh, lots of uh, names of processes so it was also interesting to understand uh, to whom these uh, newspapers delivered of course uh, who was uh, their audience and uh, yeah most likely it wasn't just like an ordinary person who can understand everything. Uh, so actually you need some uh, some expertise, uh, expertise in the field. Uh, but then on the other hand, it was also very interesting that still in the uh, Soviet newspapers, we were still able to find some uh, personal uh, histories uh, of, uh, of people who came to Visaginas uh, 
they shared their life trajectories, uh, their success on in the industry. Then we were also, uh, we were able to see their pictures. Uh, uh, actually, they were quite central in these pictures, uh, taking pictures next to different nuclear objects or of the reactor itself. Um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, when dismantling, uh, this human factor is almost eliminated from newspapers. And we also thought, why, why so? And uh, one of the reasons was that it's actually not noble anymore to, it's not noble to disassemble a nuclear power plant. Uh, and uh, it's not only that these people disassemble a nuclear power plant, but uh, they are kind of disassembling the the identity of the place, uh, people's memories, and their their emotions and feelings that uh, are connected uh, to the nuclear power plant. Uh, uh, so yeah, probably this is very briefly about what we wrote about. But super, I think in general this confronting construction and dismantling is is in general very very relevant as we as we discussed uh, for for nuclear industry in general where dismantling is a really really long term and really kind of costly and and very demanding process and I think it's 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 also it's a very interesting kind of case which could uh, kind of reorient our thinking uh, about you know. Uh, Productivity, let's say that like people think that only startups are is something valuable, but I think this process is also showing how shutdown is is also demanding and and kind of creative creative process. So I think in in general, in uh, especially in this current uh, you know current uh, moment of uh, how we make sense of uh, climate crisis, I think it's super super interesting to think about shutdowns as something. Uh, as something uh, demanding and interesting and not just uh, something that should be forgotten uh, quickly. So it's a super, super interesting lens. And probably if I can also add that, uh, I think now, uh, since you mentioned climate change, uh, climate change and sustainability issues, it's also like interesting to think about uh, uh, Ignalina nuclear power plant and in general nuclear energy uh, in the light of the COP uh, that was just like uh, last month and that uh, they were also discussing uh, nuclear issues and there was, was like a group of people actually uh, promoting uh, nuclear energy so it's also interesting to, to rethink uh, the decision of uh, the uh, European Commission to dismantle this uh, nuclear power plant. Yeah. So, so super. So maybe we just go go further. And uh, Michal, uh, Miriam, maybe you would like to say something. You know, could be content-wise, could be could be you know reflexive. I mean, whatever. Uh, Miriam, do you want to start? Ah, uh, wait, you don't see me. Okay, yeah. Hi. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm very happy to see you all. But I can't really tell anything content wise, I guess, because my kid is downstairs and I'm really not so focused. But I'm, yeah, really glad to see you all. And I'm also very happy that this, um, yeah, this project, let's say, ca came to an end. For me, I have to admit, yeah, it was a really long process and every, let's say, half a year, there was an email. Uh, yeah, let's rework the article. Let's go into this direction, go into that direction. And yeah, I found it, especially at the end, because we were from 2017. So at the end, I felt like, oh, my God, can I actually say anything about it? So I was so happy that, Sierra, that you joined in and yeah, I actually brought this to an end because for me, I have to admit, I felt so disconnected and also, wow, do we actually have some knowledge about it after all these years? But yeah, I'm really looking forward. I have don't have the book yet, um, but yeah, really happy to see you all. And I'm listening with half an ear, but I, I think I'm gonna switch off my camera maybe because I will be down here and play, but I'm listening to you, yeah. Greetings. <laughs> uh, 
yeah. Uh, maybe I will follow. Maybe I will follow up. Uh, I would like to thank Miriam as well, and the great contribution was made by Sergey. That's. Uh, I think that's the main point because, uh, as Miriam said before, it, it was from time to time it was really hard for us to uh, immerse into the text after this long time because was it 2017 that we were in on the summer school, yeah. Uh, but uh, if I can say something about the text, it was all about our inquiry into the like privatization and the property ownership in Visagina, so the text somehow plays with the with the metaphor of reacting to that together, which means the reacting of the old regime of, of the state owned uh, state owned property uh, with the newly uh, broad uh, ideology with transformation, which is uh, based on privatization. And of course, this cultural condition of privatism, which we were trying to uh, work with and at the same time somehow question it in uh, in the context of the nuclear city, uh, which means what does the privatism mean in the context of the Visaginas? Uh, uh, and by that, I mean, uh, in the context of the migration, uh, in the context with, with the problems of the dismantling the, the nuclear power plant, the exodus of the, of the Russian speaking people after 1991, and so on and so forth. So we were, uh, and thanks to thanks to Miriam, uh, who was able to read in uh, in, in Russian uh, Russian newspapers. Uh, we were working with the Dobry Den uh, newspaper, uh, and according to that, we, we are we were trying, uh, based on like fourteen or seventeen days uh, visit to Visaginas and really uh, really short inquiry, we were trying to analyze. The, the newspaper and what does it say about the uh, I would say the working or or the the management of the housing property market uh, after 1991 and then after during the times that there were those privatization laws in Lithuania and in the end to somehow compare it with the with the processes that took place in Central and Eastern Europe countries around those years, I mean, 1990s, uh, in Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, and, and I think that's it. So really, I'm really glad to that, that, uh, that uh, uh, our article is finished. Uh, thanks again to Sergey and, and Miriam, and it was really nice to see some of you guys that are that we've seen before, and some of you I didn't know are really nice to meet you. So thank you very much. So for, uh, thanks, thanks, Michal. I think that uh, maybe Martinez, we, we said that you're a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of strained with, with timing. Maybe maybe you want to go now and, and talk a little bit about your chapter. Yeah, sure. Thank you for a word. Um, actually, I would also like to uh, say huge thanks to Sergey Ben, also the lab. Um, because uh, this time was very long for all, all these editings and we made a lot of uh, variants of our article but in general I felt like this process uh, really taught me a lot and I'm very glad about these all editings <laughs> you, you suggested to us um, so yeah uh, together with Majlis we wrote an article about uh, Chernobyl memory in the Sajinas landscape and maybe now when we like most of us saw the HBO series it's like a very obvious topic the big topic uh, the power plant and, and Chernobyl relation but actually when I'm trying to look back to the 2017 um, we all also started our research uh, not, uh, not not we were not hooked by this kind of topic of Chernobyl immediately. We were also sitting in a basement in the library um, and reading all those newspapers. And uh, after getting from 90s newspapers where you see this kind of uh, early capitalism and advertisements, and then in, in the 70s, uh, the optimism of uh, 
Soviet so socialism. Um, between all these articles, uh, we saw some tendency that was kind of shifting from from early newspapers, early issues with a lot of optimism to, to the more uh, recent newspapers. And uh, there was this kind of notion that uh, something was different, uh, some, some um, like fear discourse appeared in, in some of the articles. And we also already kind of got an impression that maybe this was because of the Chernobyl disaster and that these cities were Towns were very uh, close to one uh, to each other, and uh, we also found in each issue, uh, starting from I think 1986, uh, in the end of the newspaper, like like nowadays, we have this kind of COVID news uh, each day, representing how many deaths were. Um, so back then there was all, all, always a small notice about radioactivity measures in the Saginas. And this really caught our attention that somehow uh, the fear was very present in, in a, uh, everyday life in the Saginas and in this kind of public realm. And then when we get out of the basement and start to, to, to walk in the city, we found, uh, I would say quite a lot of, uh, symbols in the public space, um, which were also somehow linked to this catastrophe of Chernobyl. Uh, they were memorials or some of them gained kind of uh, meanings during the time. Um, so yeah, we sat down and uh, kind of <laughs> decided to present it, this in the, in the format of memory infrastructure. So there was not like one object, but rather kind of infrastructure of them within the city. Um, and then later on, we, we, we got this proposal to maybe develop it further into kind of landscape artistic proposal. And that's what we did also in, the, in, in our article, in our part of the book. So <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, you should kind of read it and uh, see it on the book. Super, thanks a lot, Martinez. And, and also great that uh, you had some also side projects uh, popping up from, from, from this engagement, like the guide, the architectural guide uh, that, that, that you did in collaboration also. So, so I think maybe it's good to start talking about this more kind of design-centered chapters and the, 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 the chapter about the, the, the library workshop itself. And I think Mio and, and Thomas uh, were there and and uh, maybe you could yeah jump in. I don't know if you received the book and had chance actually to refresh it again because it was really as it was the documentation yes, but plus informed by some research. So it's uh, yeah it was uh, yeah. So I don't know. You want to say something? Uh, yes, I can say something. Uh, I received book. Uh, did not have chance really to to read it through, but uh, uh, remembering the good times in Visaginas, not just uh, as uh, somebody who was writing article, but uh, time spent there. Uh, what we were actually trying to do was to look at the city as a kind of knowledge society and and. Uh, library is a vital and important place in it, although the current situation uh, does not confirm this thesis. So it was kind of in between speculative approach what library could be and the kind of rather sad reality of it, uh, because it was some kind of plan of um, also dismantling it, uh, same as a, as a power plant or moving it to, into another space. So we took a kind of, I would say, brave decision uh, to say uh, we will kind of update it, you know, uh, which will go directly against the market principles, which will say, hey, destroy it, it has no value or uh, build a new one. So we're kind of trying to, to work with the existing fabric, we spend some time there, we talk with a lot of people, uh, we saw some important qualities and we saw the whole um, network of other institutions in the city which could 
be actually uh, sharing maybe some programmatic part uh, of library. So this was, I, I think, the first step, understanding library not just as a, as a kind of a box with, uh, with books, but as a, also a networked system. And secondly, we extend the idea of uh, um, knowledge and learning into so-called knowledge park. Uh, it was, I think, set to show one, one slide of it. Uh, so as a kind of set of uh, uh, different uh, typology of uh, learning, informing and remembering uh, the, the knowledge produced in Mr. Guinness, which has, uh, you know, interventions in public space, which has some kind of uh, relation with schools, with, which has a proposal to move some parts of library or, or some knowledge that is in the power plant back to the city. And at the end, to also to end up in some kind of memorialization of it. So um, this was rather, uh, I would say, speculative or scenario-based uh, article slash research. But I'm glad that we managed to squeeze it into book, academic book and say, hey, uh, uh, we also have some kind of ideas. And I'm curious because I haven't been in this again uh, last two three years if there is some resonance of uh, what we did in that uh, time uh, in the current, maybe cultural policy or on the, let's say, yeah, a level of uh, mayors. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's shortly, and uh, I'm gonna read the article again. <laughs> no, I won't say, I just received a book like uh, two days ago. So it's a it's my Christmas literature. It's piling on the on the with other books. So I, I promise you all that I will uh, read it from the beginning till the end. And yeah, I'm glad that we are also continuing the, the tradition of laboratory uh, to publish from every five years a book. Uh, and uh, I hope we're gonna uh, uh, carry on. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's hard times for uh, for writers uh, because nobody reads books anymore. So I uh, I hope we, at the end we'll just meet each other and write to each other. So a good printed book uh, on my table. It's uh, the best present I could have for Christmas. So yeah, thanks again, of course, for uh, for uh, stamina in uh, pushing this till the really end with uh, you know I would say no resources uh, except time. And then, um, yeah, I hope, uh, I'm always interested in, uh, maybe this will be the last uh, in the really into impact, being this measurable or not measurable, you know, like how our uh, work can have a impact uh, on, on, yeah, on the realities in this again, you know. So if, if Thomas wants to say something, uh, also he was part of our uh, crew, I think. Yes. Um, I think as you have yeah, also summarized what this chapter was about, I thought maybe I can, can add a bit, a bit um, also on the participants' perspective, um, as um, I think this, this chapter especially was, was summarizing um, the, the results of our summer school in 2016. And um, I think this also uh, deserves uh, to be mentioned that I think this, this approach with the summer schools and now being implemented into this, this book chapters um, uh, is a bit of a special thing that, um, you know, during my studies, I had the chance to um, participate in several summer schools. And I really like this format of, um, yeah, being able to learn in a certain spatial environment and so on. But I think the experience in Visaginas was unique in this way that it really was this specific project was uh, which was to be implemented and uh, that everyone was was immediately um, um, yeah, part of this and, and found its role in the process. And um, if I recall correctly, I think we only had these two days of introduction of getting to know the power plant and general information on visa Guinness, and then we are immediately starting the, the work they're doing the in interviews and uh, again you know the situation of the of the library and um, yeah the, the status quo and and the needs of the knowledge infrastructures in town and um, 
yeah, even though it's now five years ago, I still remember this quite quite vividly as some um, yeah concentrated work, but also a lot of fun. Um, and I think it really is interdisciplinary ideal where we could benefit from these different perspectives. And I know people with background from socio sociology and cultural studies could collect information and uh, the architects immediately uh, translating it into this this model, um, which was the suggestion in, in, this, in this chapter also. And um, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, then of course it was great to, to, to have the opportunity to continue working on this, um, uh, uh, yeah, Bringing, bringing the results together in this chapter, which of course was uh, then also quite a challenge as it's then to have this many different aspect, uh, perspectives and uh, a lot of information um, so to make a concise uh, text out of it. As I heard, this was not only the problem for our chapter, but for others as well. So I think we also we can say a great thank you to uh, editors for, for the guidance and um, yeah. Uh, making making also this part what it is right now and um, yeah maybe to just to, to sum it up I think it's um, I really think it, it's a great and uh, and special approach of this applied research and um, so uh, yeah also from my side a uh, big thank you to the organizers of the summer school and uh, and the editors and uh, yeah I hope that this is not the, the the final final result of this book, but that you you keep up this this good and valuable work. Super, yeah, super, Thomas and you. Actually, you may be time to to say that uh, there were supposed to be three sections in the book. Actually, one was supposed to be on the innovations in library design. Unfortunately, we didn't make it, but we just postponed it. Probably the one of the next steps of the laboratory would be to do something, but it's it's uh, connected to paternity and maternity so i think it's just it's, it's it's being postponed but it doesn't doesn't mean that it's being forgotten so maybe the third the the, the third section that was planned to meet initially maybe might come back as a as a separate project and also yes we will probably announce and send and send uh, some uh, emails maybe invitations about the next steps of, of, of work in this arena so also it's still that there are discussions a little bit rough so far but uh, but something could be uh, yeah up, uh, yeah yeah yeah, perhaps just uh, jump in that it was really nice that uh, Thomas mentioned the, the 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 kind of unusual structural the unusual process of uh, working on the books and I mean, Kuch sort of presented it as though it was an, just another book uh, you know on the on the on the on the coffee table waiting for Christmas but I think that it really is a unique process of, of uh, work it's very intensive summer schools very diverse uh, group of uh, pa participants and then uh, uh, a long process of, of, of bringing it to, to fruition and it means that it's a, the, the kind of final product which is maybe not a final product a kind of step Towards further future endeavors is also a kind of curious, uh, a curious product, but one one which, because of the kind of the very rich uh, uh, array of different personalities and different energies, which you know this this kind of strange Zoom book presentation really gives a nice sense of that people in different places with different uh, different uh, pre preoccupations, but also different dynamisms. I, I think that the final product is. Uh, you know, an, an unusually rich uh, treasure house of, of, of ideas that could be taken further. And I, I'm not trying to kind of, I'm not saying that to sort of uh, make myself feel more, more important. I, I think it's, uh, I think it, it's genuinely the case. So it's really nice, Thomas, that you mentioned the the, the, pro the process. So maybe maybe it's time, like Monica, Ben, you could talk about your chapter also, uh, because. It's actually it also dates back to sixteen still. Yeah, Monica, maybe you'd like to start with something if you're if you're, if you're there. I'm I'm happy to. Who goes first? <laughs> um, yeah, I can only add to to what Thomas was saying um, concerning the process. It took a long time, but it was it's super cliche to say in these uh, occasions that it was very inspiring, but. I'll say it anyway, it was very inspiring uh, 
stay and uh, process also and it's only a couple of years later that you realize what all the takeaways were and what how well important for me personally also the stay and the, the process was um in terms of um being in the field and having only two days of introduction then okay go explore experiment and think about um something that really interests you and where you get hooked and so um that was very weird and uh, uh well challenging but um i think very fruitful process for all of us um and well for me also um topic wise and also well we started in in 2016 with the with the interviews and then um with a first draft and then was um well enriched by mostly Ben's uh, experiences that came after that and um also with new ideas and new inputs and um so also just I came to realize what uh, the role also of, of the topic is and how still recent uh, developments with um, incoming uh, tourists from the Chernobyl miniseries or um, international media attention, academic attention, um, but also now the, the very big topic of um, the uh, migrants and refugees at the Belarusian border are putting this um, migration topic for Visaginas and um, on a very different level and um, so what we tried to say in the chapter was and still applies today that um, there's a big chance and um, high relevance to put the migration perspective in a in a different lens and in a different sense and appreciate just mostly the the knowledge and the experiences and different trajectories that are intersected and entangled in in visaginas and um it's it's kind of hard not to talk about like the potential and the knowledge gained from all these mi migratory um biographies and it's hard not to talk about this too much in economic terms about the money and the social capital and the value now back attributed to to Visaginas through this different kind of knowledge but this is I think kind of what the chapter tries to say that there is just a very strong social cultural um, um, relevance and value in in the different migration experiences and I talked all around the topic but didn't really explain what we tried to say in the in the chapter. If you want to take over, then. Yeah, Monica, it's really nice to see you again after you know so so much intense uh, work working together on the on on the on the uh, article, but never being in the same place. I was really hoping you, you were going to say what the article was about, so I could talk around the topic. But I guess this is uh, just uh, shows uh, uh, how creative uh, co co authorship can be. Um, yeah, I, I think just our, our our topic kind of exploring and experimenting with what the what the library uh, could be if uh, reacts towards the the question of migration or kind of transnational uh, um, citizenship of many uh, many Visiginous migrants. Um, was one of those chapters uh, where we tried to build on something which is kind of exceptional to Visiginous its uh, kind of position in uh, uh, historical nodes and current nodes of uh, migration in very different uh, directions and to kind of argue that this uh, often seen as a problem in terms of uh, Visaginas being described as a Russian kind of Russian exclave in Visaginas or a shrinking town that this could be turned into a kind of potential that there are many different kinds of uh, knowledge and experience uh, and networks uh, being created and this could be a potential uh for the for the town uh, this was kind of um um you know, trying to look at something which is specific to the case of missy guinness but also kind of ask a broader question about what libraries 
uh, how libraries might uh, change or what the challenges or potentials for libraries are in an age of the uh, increased uh, mobility of, uh, of, of of readers or inhabitants and and uh, and knowledge so this was kind of trying to look at the specificity the specificity of resilience in one way but also kind of use that specificity to pose a, a wider question to the to the the future role of um, the future role of libraries and uh, yeah, but you, but you talked around it beautifully, so that, that this would be nice. But I think maybe it shouldn't be shared like too much, as also uh, for people to get the book and to and to and to read the chapter. Also, it should be maybe more more teaser like. I think uh, like we we like the, the, the those co-authors, I guess, that are here uh, had chance to talk to reflect about it. Of course, like a great uh, treasure for the book is designed. It was done by Anna. So Anna, maybe you want to show uh, also uh, talk a little bit about the, about the uh, process uh, and about how your approach uh, how your approach evolved and yeah, maybe show some steps. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sergey. I would like also to start with a thank you for the, for the whole team who you know did the articles and the whole book because I had to imagine through your texts texts oh, sorry uh, how this again is or you know to make a picture out of it because I was never in Lithuania and I was never in Visaginas. I am from Kishinev from Moldova. Yes, we are part of the kind of Soviet era we were let's say and um, it's a really beautiful town for me the Visaginas itself because um, when I got the proposal from Marina she just told me that okay there there's a series of essays which are about this town and I just did a fast you know google search and I was like wow what a beautiful town you know and uh, that was like the starting point of the collaboration and um, I had mostly been in discussion with Sergei and with Ben, but mostly with Sergei. So uh, I had the most, like, um, let's say, the, the most uh, feedback and the most, uh, he, he was giving me the direction. It was more from Sergei. So, yeah, I will tell you a bit about the steps, but in a very easy and, you know, like relaxing way because everything that was before me was a really deep, you know, uh, look through, through the book and from the information that was presented in it. So I will give you just, you know, like some <laughs> childish questions maybe you would like me to answer. So yeah, I will try to present. Okay. One second. Okay, so this is the title of the book. And I would like to speak a bit about the color we chose um, because why bluish gray, you know, it could be any other color and what does it say? And of course we started from the power plant and uh, my first proposal was really like uh, from the surface. Yeah, it's a green city, lots of forest, the pine trees and the stuff, and it might be greenish. And I also liked that the titles in the newspapers were kind of this um, lively green, let's call it like this. And I remember <laughs> Sergey saying, okay, the green is cool, but it's really too obvious. And we maybe should search for some deeper, um, I don't know, the, the, the deeper uh, reflections on this. And we were thinking about something which would be like more related to the power plant, the radiation and, you know, the things which are kind of related to each other in this kind of uh, key. and to me was more like clear when I heard the word graphite, you know, which is some kind of a part of the technical stuff in the plant. And um, 
it was easier to find the color when you got in the hub, which are the elements, the key elements, which make a power plant, you know. So that's how we came to this grayish blue, which is uh, like the, the main uh, color throughout through the whole book. And then we had to find the rhythm of a book, also some graphic elements, which would maybe unite the text and the pictures and maybe create something, a dynamic uh, side of the book. So here it was just my own feeling, how I you know, perceived all the articles and the information from them. And I came out of, with this pattern, which I, it to me, it looked similar with the horns from the power plant. And then Sergei came with the thought that this also looks like the reactor uh, pieces. I don't know how to say it from, they also have this kind of a rhythm and we thought, okay, this might be something that really sticks to the idea of the book and might give, you know, maybe just, it, it, you know, it's different. Everyone can interpret this in their own way. So, yeah, this kind of rhythm, I wanted to reflect it also in the text box. So, um, of course, I had the last year uh, books which were printed one about Vilnius and other about the Saginus, and I had, you know, to go um, to start from that and maybe develop something different, which was the main idea which I wanted to choose. Yeah, to be a bit different from what was before. And we took the, you know, the two columns which were in the past, and I just wanted to make more dynamic approach in that. So also to have this, uh, you know, connection to the pattern, which I did for the book cover. And this is how a spread looks now uh, for those who have the book physically. I do not have it yet, but I'm still really waiting for it to see. So, I had kind of to design it, but I did not have the opportunity to be there, you know, when the printing began. And uh, so I would like just to have a small mention, please excuse the small lapses, the technical lapses, because it was not real to make this, you know, in the other way, the pandemics were giving us this context. And the book architecture, um, I did like um, graphic, for myself, which I divided the introduction, I made it black and white. Then I had the two chapters with uh, each one of them having five essays. And I wanted them to be like more uh, like a mix of uh, the gray and the, the bluish gray and the black. So they had the pictures, the text, and they were more like, um, how to say the word? Um, concentrated with content and then we also have the acknowledgements which i made i did it on purpose i did the text bigger and i give it the serif font just to make it look like uh, um like we had this in soviet times you know like uh it had a celebration like feeling you know like we celebrate the authors and of the book and we give them like a special place, a special color and a special uh, even size of the letter. So they feel, you know, special from the, the rest of the book because that part is the research and here's like the thankfulness for all of this. So yeah, and the black line is also all the list of the authors. And yes, the, the general look of the book, it's different from the, the others that you have in the laboratory in the past years. And I thought if I had the opportunity to make it different on the inside, because I kind of changed the grid a bit. I mean, we used the, some things from the past um, composition of the book, but we also did some changes and that kind of gave me the, this, the open door to make it different on the cover. And you know that those doors from the inside, where is the, um the summary it also was a decision we did uh, in the last moment uh, because of some technical restrictions and most of the let's say creative um, decisions we did in the book were like um, a part of the technical uh, adaptation so yeah i would like to thank you that's all <laughs> From my part, if you have any questions regarding the design, you can give them now. I'm open to answer. 
but I'm really grateful I had this occasion. I would like to say I don't have these so many occasions to work on such great books or such great researches as yours. So I'm really pleased to be here and to, I don't know, to interact with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very, very, very smooth. And I think the, I think the understanding uh, among us uh, uh, yeah, it was very easy, and and I think the, the the only thing is that as it often happens with the with the publishing at the late stages, you start to be really in a hurry because you understand that you are already quite late, and so you just get nervous because of the timetable. Because first, of course, we just uh, we wait, you know, like holidays, you know, another semester, you know, to finish the text, and then when everything is done, of course, you want to be really in a hurry. So maybe that was the only kind of. Uh, nervous part of it but 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 generally i think the, the design is great and also it was basically it was a collective thing that we that we uh, came to this kind of metaphor of this airbnb key of the, of generally of the of the rods of the of the reactor because i think and and the water i think it's it's fantastic it's a, it's a very interesting visual metaphor for me i guess so so which which evolved precisely in this kind of collaborative uh, ping pong uh, uh, mode. So yeah, I I myself very 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 happy about uh, the, the the visual uh, solution. So yeah yeah. So uh, thank you. Yeah yes yeah, So I guess like those. Uh, I think now basically we should open the floor. Maybe there are some uh, questions, reflections, whatever uh, propositions for the future. We're still on a Facebook video for those people who might be interested to buy the book, for example, the, those who are uh, not in, because the, the book is sold in, 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 in shops in Vilnius, but uh, uh, it could be also ordered uh, online. I'm only saying that uh, uh, at some point we could just stop uh, uh, Facebook streaming and uh, just uh, stay and talk a little bit uh, informally totally, but I think let's let's maybe uh, open the floor for some some still some questions uh, propositions reflections etc critique and um, you know if there is something like this yeah if nothing i think uh, uh, if no one wants to to talk now, so I think uh, we could just uh, stay anyway. If, if you are not in a hurry, I will just call uh, and we uh, disconnect from Facebook, and we could just stay and and uh, like we could just say bye bye after we disconnected from Facebook, or we should say bye bye now. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give a call and ask to uh, disconnect from Facebook. So I think it's it's if someone has uh, maybe I should check if there are questions on. Uh, uh, Questions to us online, just uh, literally. Uh...